Hello, everyone. I'm Aaron Good, and for this very special episode of the American Exception Podcast, I'm joined by guest co-host Ben Howard. Ben, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Aaron. Today, we have brought together an outstanding cast of people who wanted to help our dear friend, Professor Peter Dale Scott. At the age of 95, Peter has completed two last books for publication after surviving a life-threatening bout of COVID, followed by triple pneumonia, which sounds tough regardless, but at age 95, it is extra challenging to overcome, I have to believe. His illness required him to spend savings on home nursing care, and he has also incurred some serious bills related to copyrighted material that he is including in his upcoming book on the Polish poet Milos, uh, who Peter collaborated with many years ago. To help Peter, our friend Freeman Ng set up a GoFundMe campaign, which we have linked to in the show description and on the screen if you are watching the video version of the episode. A little after this GoFundMe campaign started, Peter asked me if I might be able to help promote this. Uh, at first, I felt some trepidation, not being a person with access to deep sources of, of funds and slush funds or conduits for cash or whatever. But after thinking about it, I, I came up with the idea for this episode, and it's basically this. We have assembled segments with great guests who are friends and or admirers of Peter Dale Scott. So you're going to be hearing from David Talbot, James Galbraith, Dan Ellsberg, Josh Oppenheimer, John Kariaku, True Anon, uh, Noah Colwyn, Oliver Stone, and Peter Dale Scott himself. Uh, as you'll hear, we didn't just want to make this like a, a PBS pledge drive or an overview of Peter's life and work. Rather, we wanted to have people talking about uh, their own work and how it relates to Peter Dale Scott's trailblazing scholarship on the deep politics of U.S. imperialism, in addition to, of course, yes, talking about Peter a good bit, too. Uh, so hopefully we have a good mix of people talking about Peter himself, as well as these other fascinating issues that Peter has written so much about for the last 50 plus years. So I want to ask you, Ben, how did you first encounter the work of Peter Dale Scott? Uh, a friend of mine, a guy named Matt Kenner, introduced me to the road to 9-11. He, he knew that I had been something of a 9-11 truther in the past, but had sort of fallen away from it. And uh, picking up that book, The Road to 9-11, uh, was totally revelatory for me because I had never read anything that uh, was so forensic and uh, so well-sourced and, so, and written in such an academic tone. Uh, on this subject before, and and uh, it just really impressed me, and and from there I sort of uh, devoured pretty much every book of his that I could get my hands on, um, and and I've just been there. There are very few writers who approach these topics with the level of erudition uh, that they really need and deserve, uh, and he's really I think been the been been one of the one of the uh, first people to do it. Uh, really invented this whole area of study in many respects, and um, and it's just produced a pretty astonishing body of work. Uh, all of his books, uh, you know, going all the way back to the War Conspiracy and and you know through to the War Machine and some of his later uh, books on these on these areas, they all they cover similar territory, and yet every single one brings new facts and analyses uh, that that um, only come from you know, decades and decades of scholarly research. And I think he's, he's such a unique writer for how long he's been doing it, uh, for how consistently it's been a, a part of his career. Um, and it's just, uh, overall a very, a very astounding body of work that I, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's great that we have it and, uh, and are able to go back to it again and again. Yes, I concur with all of that. And I, I find, uh, the, the, the dimensions of his work to be staggering on the whole, that he has paid articles and books and chapters and books that he's written that are that, that you might not even know about or, or come across after already being familiar with his work for years that are full of just amazing facts. And it's not just the intellectual or scholarly stamina and rigor to be able to do this. It's, a, it's so overwhelming in its implications that it has to, it, it takes a kind of spiritual 
um, endurance and uh, and will to be able to uh, grapple with this material because it's psychically um, it, it's it takes a toll on you psychically and yet it's uh, decades and decades he he has done this like there's really I don't think there's anyone else who who compares. Yeah, I mean, I think it, he is also unique in the, in being a parapolitical writer who's produced a lot of poetry that touches on these topics and touches on what you just what you just mentioned the the uh, the fact that these topics are very uh, can be very dark and depressing and difficult to difficult to study for decades at a time uh, and it, and a lot of his poetry it seems to me is is his way of um, trying to work through those problems and as uh, as people who ourselves, we are interested in, in getting into these topic areas and sometimes need a bit of psychological assistance. I think that his poetry serves that role very well. Um, so I think, you know, he's, he's really put it, all of himself into this. Um, and I think that comes through both in his prose as well as in his poetry. Yes. I think that he here at the, uh, near the end of his life, I mean, he's he's 95, so I, I'm thinking he could maybe live to see 110 uh, at this at the at the rate he's at now, because he still is he still has a lot on the ball, as you're going to hear, uh, and finishing these last two books. But I am also happy to do this in a way to bring together all the people that are not all the people, but some of the people who have been influenced uh, by him and can offer. Uh, some insight into uh, the, the subject areas themselves, but also how he's been able to help them. And one of these people is the author, uh, journalist, historian, David Talbot. I, I think it's time to to bring him in. And I know that many of our listeners already know who he is. He is a former senior editor at Mother Jones. Uh, and then he founded Salon.com, where he, he exposed a, a lot of the chicanery around the right-wing elements even more right wing than Bill Clinton that were trying to take down Bill Clinton back then, and they were they were pretty good during the Bush years. The, the liberal, the left liberal press was 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 different than it became under Obama in those times, and I think David Talbot was a part of that. Most notably, for our purposes, David Talbot wrote "Brothers: The Hidden History of the Kennedy Years," as well as "The Devil's Chessboard," Alan Dulles, the CIA, and the Rise of America's Secret Government. So now we're going to hear what David Talbot has to say on this occasion. David Talbot, thank you for joining us again. Thank you, Aaron. So I ordered your book, Brothers, when it came out in 2007, but I didn't get around to reading it until after 2009, after I had worked for Obama. I think that if I had read that book first, I I may not have worked for Obama. So it's funny how life works out. I, I followed your work and media appearances and such after this because I, I like the book so much. And I read a number of other books, including uh, on JFK, including those by Peter Dale Scott. When you wrote Devil's Chessboard and you mentioned that Peter had inspired you to write the book, I thought that was very cool, uh, not just because I admired Peter's work, but because it was heartening to know that the two of you were good friends out there in the Bay Area. So in, in, in your words, how did uh, Peter and his deep politics approach influence your own evolution as a journalist and historian? Thank you, Aaron, and, and thanks for uh, doing this program. You, you know, Peter's uh, been a mentor and inspiration to me for many years, uh, before Devil's Chessboard, before Brothers. Uh, Peter's, I think, 20 years older, so he's been around a while doing the great work that he's, he's been doing, and uh, he's been a maverick uh, all his life intellectually. He's asked the questions that should be asked by the intellectual establishment, the academic establishment in this country, but often, too often, are not. Peter, maybe because he was born in Canada, maybe just because his personality he likes to get the truth, no matter how unsettling and how dark it is. So one day I happened to have lunch, uh, my colleague Karen Croft and I, with Peter. And we, as you say, are friends with Peter out here in the Bay Area. And we've had lunch. It was a rainy day in Berkeley. And he happened to mention when he was a young professor at Cal at UC Berkeley, he'd been invited to uh, a luncheon at the Hoover Institute down in Palo Alto. 
uh, he was had been a, uh, a diplomat, a Canadian diplomat to Poland. So he was thought of as kind of a Cold War guy in those days, someone who uh, was on their side, on the conservative side. And he went to his luncheon and he was appalled. This is, I, I believe, in 1962 or early 63. He's appalled at the uh, the kind of animus against President Kennedy that was on display at this luncheon. And uh, all these people were griping in very dark terms or angry terms about the president, how he'd sold the country out of the communist, how he'd, he'd been to them during the Cuban Missile Crisis and so on. And what are we going to do about this guy? And suddenly, this, according to Peter, an Eastern Orthodox uh, priest got up, and he was kind of the alpha male in the room. And he said, held up his hands, he quieted all the, you know, griping, and he said, the old man will take care of it. So Peter thought the old man at the time referred to Joe Kennedy, uh, the president's father. I knew that Joe Kennedy had a stroke and was unable to say anything at that point, was in a wheelchair and really could only mumble. He was not in a position to be the patriarch, be the fixer he'd once been. I knew the old man was the nickname within CIA circles, intelligence circles, for Alan Dulles. Well, when Peter told me that story, I the veils fell before my eyes, from my eyes. Uh, I realized how important this was. So Peter, yet again, had given me the seed for my book about Alan Dulles being the main conspirator against President Kennedy and the devil's chessboard. Uh, I lay that out very carefully. Um, but it started in, with a conversation with Peter, as so many things do. Peter is, a, I think, a uh, restless intellect and a poet, someone who thinks far and wide about things. I tend to get very angry, very passionate about certain things. He's Canadian by nature or, or his nature. He's more of a uh, 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 old soul, a generous person. He never, I've seen him get angry. He's able to talk to people on the other side who have very opposing views on the Kennedy assassination from what I do. Uh, because Peter's a nice guy, basically. He's uh, a gift, a gift to all people who want the truth about how power works in this country. Peter has been at this in a generous free-spirited way uh, for many, many years. And as I say, he inspired me not only to write The Devil's Chessboard, but to do the work I do. And so here's to Peter Dale Scott. I know he's been an inspiration to you too, Aaron, and many, many others. Yes, absolutely. And he, the way, there are many people that you could point to as examples of persistence, but he, he stands alone in the, in the sort of realm he occupies, I think. His final book, and he's working on these into his 90s, we paused this oral history series we were doing because he not only fell ill, but he needed to finish two books. Uh, he felt compelled to finish them in his 90s, I think at age 94. He may have just turned 95. Um, his last book is called In Mindment, and while I haven't read it yet, I know uh, that no human being has really been a minder quite the way that he has. It, it led to a nervous breakdown of sorts before he wrote Coming to Jakarta, partly as a therapeutic exercise, which sounds strange to think of for a scholar. But when you look at the scope of his work, it makes sense. Uh, in his writing, we see how he keeps learning all these mind-blowing things about the powerful people and forces that dominate the U.S. and its global empire. And writing about all this never brought him reward or renown outside of the admiration of a, a pretty disparate group of people, some of them, you know, great people. But, uh, you know, that's a small number of people that are actually interested in this material. Uh, and yet he is compelled to do it. What, how do you think of this as a how do you reflect on this uh, on on his lifetime of, of pursuing this kind of work? And how does it how should it inform other people that that? Uh, want to get at the truth, uh, you know, regardless that that, that that see it as a worthy exercise, even if these forces are so powerful and we can't easily change them. You know, how do we how, how do we conceptualize these things? 
Well, that's a good question. It goes to the heart of who Peter is, as I was saying earlier. There's this great quote by the uh, Italian dissident, uh, Antonio Gramsci, uh, pessimism, uh, pessimism of the will, uh, and uh, of the intellect, rather, and, and optimism of the will. I think Peter embodies that. He's someone who, as I said, is able to analyze the darkest forces uh, at work within the American power structure and still be uh, an optimistic person. I heard him give a speech maybe two years ago, right before two and a half, three years ago, right before the, the pandemic closed things down. And uh, again, he was almost uh, Pollyannish is what I called him at the time about the future of this country and where we were would, where we're headed. Uh, here's someone who's lived through the 50s, the Cold War, the 60s, the, the, the great radical movements of the 60s into the 70s and 80s, the, the backlash against those progressive radical movements. And yet he's still at his age, and he was about 90 at the time, um, you know, he still maintains this very optimistic sense of the world, of life. Uh, you know, he entered into an interesting dialogue with the fellow poet, Canadian poet, Leonard Cohen, near the end of Leonard's life. They remained uh, close friends throughout their lives. Um, Leonard and Peter, in some ways, were the disciples of uh, Peter's father, who was a poet laureate of uh, Canada. And uh, they were like brothers, Leonard Cohen and Peter Dale Scott. And at the end, uh, you know, famously, Leonard had a very dark view of life. Uh, you Went Darker was the name of his album. Uh, and he accused Peter in a very friendly way of wanting things lighter. <laughs> and they had an interesting dialogue, which I think is in one of the books uh, that was published after Leonard Cohen's uh, death. Uh, and included this dialogue, this email dialogue that Peter and Leonard had. Peter does want a lighter, and I'm inspired by that. Um, he does tend to think that we will win in the end, and that's a good thing. That kind of optimism of the will is very necessary right now because things, whether it's climate change or the, the political debacle that is America, uh, there's many reasons to be very cynical. And I have children, as you do, Aaron. I have two uh, young sons. Who are one in their 20s, one in their early 30s. And I want to give them a better world. That's what we all hope for our children, that they inherit a better world. And uh, Peter gives me the kind of um, uh, sustenance and support to go on as a writer, as an intellectual, as a dissident in this country, uh, because Peter has paved the way for so many of us and shows that you can maintain your will and your stamina <laughs> into your 90s. He's writing books, as you point out, Aaron, into his 90s. How many people do that? The, the stamina of the man is, a, is amazing. I'm always in, you know, amazed by how much energy he has when I get together with Peter for lunch and, and see him. He's read my books. He's read other books. He's, he's writing his own books. He's uh, an amazing whirlwind of energy and activity, despite his recent illness, uh, which we were all afraid would be his final, uh, you know, uh, cataclysm. And yet he rebounded from his illness, uh, not financially, which is what we're here for, but he did in terms of his uh, his intellect and, and his vitality. So um He's inspiration, again, uh, to me, to you, to all of us, and uh, long may he wave. That's what I think as well. I, and I, I feel that I, I agree with you about the optimism of the soul uh, a, a, and that it, it's difficult to wrap your mind around this, this aspect of it because we are used to, as we look at these things and we learn more and we're driven to learn more in a way it's a democratic impulse to uh, to to think that and and comes from you know in the enlightenment and other kind of aspects of our society that we feel like it's important to understand the workings of power and illuminate them but the more we learn the more we realize that it's not such a democratic society but we still have these kind of habits of mind where we want to talk about them and persuade people and think that it matters what we do and uh, I, I think it has to be, it's something in the human spirit in a way. It's not just a matter of conditioning growing up in this society, but it's that we people 
are people want to know the truth and there's a no, and the majority i think is basically good in humanity and so you have to you, it's a calling for people i think it's a calling for people like peter and i i think it has to be for you as well uh and i feel that way and, and this is uh and Aaron, let me let me let me interject this something about peter and you and me which is we've been sidelined by the intellectual establishment in this country uh the same fate has befallen Peter, even though he's a full professor in uh, English literature at UC Berkeley for many years. He was still sidelined for his power research. And you have been the same. You've uh, faced the same obstacles. And I have. The New York Times, the Washington Post, they said they wouldn't touch. This is a quote from the editor, uh, the book review editor at the Washington Post, said he wouldn't touch uh, the devil's chessboard told my book publicist with a 10 foot pole. So that's the kind of like, uh, you know, way that we're blacklisted still in this country. If you're an intellectual who dares to actually seek the truth about how this country really operates, you're sidelined, you're uh, ridiculed, you're attacked. And Peter, uh, again and again, faced the same thing. He couldn't break into the New York Review of Books. He couldn't break into the New York Times. People like him and Noam Chomsky become, I think, uh, kind of aliens within their own country. And yet Peter kept on going on. He found sustenance at conferences where people realized the importance of his research. It was his book, Deep Politics, that got me really thinking in a deep way about the Kennedy assassination. Peter has that ability because he operates like a great scholar. He wants the facts. He works with the documents. He told me, warned me once, don't rely on interviews. Uh, you, you rely too much on interviews with people. You want to know actually what was being said uh, by these people behind closed doors at the time. Because people often, of course, in retrospect, uh, you know, shade their, their memories or their memories are faulty. And that's true. So you have to actually uh, reinforce your interviews uh, with documentary evidence whenever possible. And Peter, as a true scholar, did that and has done that throughout his career. He's backed up his power analysis, I think, with hard facts, with hard evidence. He's not a conspiracy theorist. He's someone who believes in research, believes that it's almost like the holy grail, that you go after it with all your powers, all your mental powers. And Peter's brought that to bear on one subject after the next, whether it's the Kennedy assassination or 9-11, all the events, Watergate, that he calls them the deep events that have happened in this country, that have changed the course of history in this country. Um, Peter has analyzed them in a way that no other intellectual really is brave enough uh, to do. So we owe an, uh, an enormous debt of gratitude to Peter Dale Scott. And um, amazed by his stamina that he's still with us and i praise the heavens that he is well here here uh we're here today to talk about peter but i'm just going to take a moment to tell you that your work is also uh spectacular and kind of in and indispensable really so uh i really appreciate you taking the time to uh, speak with us today thank you Aaron. thank you so much now see if you can No Listening to to what David just had to say, I think it's uh, I think his both of those books, both Brothers and The Devil's Chessboard, uh, they they so clearly follow on Peter's work, both directly in terms of the subject matter, uh, but also his method that that very forensic method of uh, you know meticulously going through do, you know primary source documents and uh, trying to tease out all of the implications of those and build them into a, a broader uh, theoretical structure rather than just a collection of facts. Um, it's, it's, um, you know, it's pretty clear Peter's influence certainly. And, and obviously David talked about that. So I'm, I'm grateful that we've got David's work as well. And, and, um, hopefully we can continue to build on, be inspired by what David has done and then, and then continue to build on that. Um, Aaron, who, who have we got, uh, who have we got next? Who are we, who are we hearing from now? Well, we've got another outstanding, uh, person, here, and that is James G. 
Galbraith. He is professor at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs and at the Department of Government uh, at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, James Galbraith is the son of John Kenneth Galbraith, the famed economist who was a tutor of John Kennedy at Harvard before becoming JFK's ambassador to India and one of his key advisors on Vietnam. I would say that John Kenneth Galbraith, like FDR, Henry Wallace, and John and Robert Kennedy, represented the most enlightened elements of the U.S. establishment, uh, really, that it's ever produced. Uh, the very best of the flawed but important New Deal tradition that part of the U.S. political class that was excised often violently from U.S. politics through the 60s and 70s, leading to what I would call the deep state's triumph with the election of Ronald Reagan. Now, James Galbraith, I would say, has really honored his father's legacy by writing some of the best articles on JFK's Vietnam withdrawal plans, most notably the 2003 piece in Boston Magazine entitled Exit Strategy, but there's other articles he's written in recent years where he's just compiled even more evidence to make that case. And I think they've decisively won the argument. It's just that the establishment can't really admit that. And so we act like it's a it's still a big controversy and a, and a mystery. Uh, James Galbraith is also the author of a number of books, including The Predator State. Uh, and he was a collaborator with Giannis Varoufakis. Uh, they together crafted a plan to remove Greece from the euro and create a sovereign currency that would allow Greece to escape its fate uh, of being a, a debt peon uh, at the hands of Western high finance. So uh, I, I, I think he is a, a, someone who is on the right side here uh, and a rare person in academia, uh, just as his father was a rare person in the U.S. Uh, political establishment. Uh, and so uh, I'm really happy that we were able to get him to come on here. Now we're going to hear from James Galbraith. <music> Professor James Galbraith, thank you for joining us. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you as always. So in a 20 or a 2003 article on JFK's planned withdrawal from Vietnam, you wrote, in 1972, Peter Dale Scott first made the case that Johnson's in Sam 273, the document that Gibbons relied on in making his case for continuity, was in fact a departure from Kennedy's policy. His essay appeared in Gravel's edition of the Pentagon Papers. Arthur Schlesinger's Robert Kennedy and his Times tells a few tantalizing pages of the first application in October 1963 of Kennedy's phased withdrawal plan. So you, you're, you're pointing out that Peter... Uh, really came up with the first detailed argument as to uh, how Kennedy was attempting to get out of Vietnam, even on the basis of very little evidence. Um, how would you describe Peter's contribution to our understanding of JFK and Vietnam in this debate that is, I think, settled, was, but somehow still going on? It was utterly foundational uh, in that uh, he looked into this matter with uh, fresh eyes and with a very strong sense of uh, you know, historical method as you would apply to to archives, which are uh, in some cases intentionally incomplete. Uh, and uh, from that, he drew inferences, uh, which were not certainly definitive at the time, but uh, uh, were strong enough so that you could believe in them quite quite forcefully, quite if, uh, and pursue them uh, and. Uh, this was in 1972, so this is really uh, just after the Pentagon Papers. Well, as the Pentagon Papers were themselves uh, uh, the, the the leading source, and one of the most important things that he points out in uh, uh, the, in, in the book on deep politics uh, is that uh, this is a very incomplete record. Uh, and this is a very significant fact that it was incomplete, that there were virtually no documents uh, that uh, covered the period from early October through in, into December of, nine, of, of 1963, uh, apart from a, a brief window in the, in the coup cables of, of, on, on Vietnam uh, in, in November, early November. Uh, 
And uh, so this raises some important questions as to whether things are actually being withheld because it's you can you can see from the ordinary course of business that documents are generated uh, you know in volume and on a regular basis in a window in which there are no relevant documents uh, at a moment of historical significance raises all kinds of red flags. Uh, so that plus the actual content of these. Uh, uh, of the texts of uh, of, um, uh, of of the Nissans um, is uh, you know where these were this was this was a work of um, what should I say uh, it, it required the talents of a historian but it also required the insight uh, of a poet of someone who reads language uh, very carefully uh, for the full range of meanings that. Uh, that and the if you like the rhythms of an archival treatment, uh, so uh, and when, when can it, one can't really praise it too highly uh, as a uh, as 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 an insight. And and given that the uh, historians of the of of that time uh, and on for a long time afterwards were held the you know sort of the, the common view that there was no. Discontinuity between Kennedy and Johnson uh, uh, at the, over the time of the assassination uh, is this. This took a lot of um, the, the word I'm thinking of is gumption, but it, it, it took it took a, it took a lot of nerve uh, to uh, to to maintain this position. Well, uh, over uh, over a period of decades, uh, and I did not really focus on this question until John Newman's book appeared in 1992 or 93. Um, really, I, I came into contact with it, I think, in the summer of 93. Uh, and, and then I became rather deeply engaged, uh, uh, which then ultimately led to the, the piece that you just quoted, uh, including some, you know, additional filling in of the of the historical record. Uh, so I, I, I come along uh, in a more or less of a cleanup position, following Peter, following John, uh, and trying to pull together uh, a summary of the historical treatments uh, to try and ascertain and, and try and, and, and put this controversy uh, to rest, uh, which I think by and large, I mean, there are obviously still people constantly coming back out with the old establishment line, but it's not really tenable. It's not really credible. Uh, I think it's really very solidly established that Kennedy did decide uh, in, I mean, it is solidly established, it's not just my opinion, that uh, Kennedy did decide uh, to uh, withdraw all U.S. forces uh, from Vietnam by the end of 1965. That was official policy. Uh, what remains, I think, uh, in uh, to, uh, to be and still open for discussion is where Johnson plays in the, all of this. Uh, and we can we can we can talk about that, but that's another set of questions, right? You um, you br you bring up that he was his his skills as a poet seem to have been brought to bear in that piece, and I have commented on how he is a, a bit of a historian and a social scientist and a and a and a poet at the same time, but I never thought about that in terms of methodology. But as you say that, I, I think that's really important to. Uh, to note, because Peter's idea of the the negative template exactly. of that that which is not spoken being key to understanding something larger is a, a part of what he had to do to construct that argument in the Pentagon Papers essay because he was going by documents that he didn't have but that were referred to in other places, and it really it, it is kind of an exercise that probably only a, a poet. Uh, could would be able the, only a poet would take that kind of approach. I actually think that's a very uh, profound insight because it helps to make sense of this because it's an amazing piece that is doesn't I don't know of any other uh, work by uh, by a major scholar on an important issue like that. Yeah, I, well, the the the, the, uh, the insight I think is a fairly natural. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you know Peter, you know his work, and you know. Uh, the the range of, of you know the quality of his mind it's there 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 are not many like it actually right I feel like there's uh I, I when he when he goes this that when he's not around and doing work on politics anymore 
the the that sort of erudition is there's not some there's not somebody that's exactly the same. We, there's other tools that we have that are allow us to get information really quickly, but that sort of erudition I think comes from an era of that only a very small number of people are that smart, and then they also don't aren't are not immersed in digital media and other things. So they develop their minds in ways that I just don't know that many people do these days. So. It's uh, it's something to reflect yeah, on. I'm 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 hopeful that that the that the, uh, the this line will not be entirely lost, but certainly uh, they, they the culture doesn't cultivate it particularly. Um, but. No, it doesn't. And when you were in your uh, you, you did follow ups on Vietnam, and you wrote in one of them. This was maybe a reply or a back and forth in the New York Review of Books, I believe, with Francis Bator. Yes. And even going by what he says, uh, which is sort of him taking the Kennedy would have gone into Vietnam probably position, but he, he the argument that he makes is basically that he would that the policy was. He admits that you're correct. The policy was a withdrawal, but he says uh, Kennedy would have reversed it. But that's actually quite a revision of the prevailing argument, which was that Kennedy was it was all in in Vietnam. I mean, now you're basically having to say, well, he would have changed his mind, which, of course, nobody could ever disprove. And, and yet, just the fact that the argument has moved to that terrain has gone unremarked well, I, upon. I, I, I knew Francis very well. Um, he was a friend. Uh, he was, and to be clear for your uh, listeners, Francis Bator was uh, the deputy national security advisor uh, to Lyndon Johnson. Uh, so although he went on to uh, to the Kennedy School at Harvard, where he spent most of the rest, where well, he spent the rest of his career, uh, uh, his uh, loyalties remain very strongly to to Lyndon Johnson, uh, and and for understandable reasons, we talked quite a lot about this. So. Um, uh, and I, I, I'm a I'm a faculty member at the Johnson School. I have I have also acquired uh, you know uh, loyalty to Lyndon Johnson. I certainly didn't feel as a teenager. Uh, but in any event, uh, Frank, I greatly appreciate it. I, I laid out because Joseph Lelevelt had um, in a review of Arthur Schlesinger's memoirs had made a more or less passing remark that there was no plan uh, to uh, end the war in Vietnam. And the word plan is a word with a very specific meaning. And I suppose in some sense, I'm taking a little inspiration from Peter. Now, you look at these words and you say, okay, what do they actually mean? Uh, a plan has to be laid out in a planning document. Uh, and so what I did in a short letter was to point out all the uh, the major uses of the word plan uh, and planning uh, that clarified that there was, in fact, a U.S. comprehensive plan for Vietnam. And it did, in fact, under Kennedy's orders, uh, have a very explicit deadlines for the withdrawal of all U.S. Uh, special forces and combat units in Vietnam. Everything was supposed to go. Uh, and this was, in fact, approved uh, and was U.S. policy when Kennedy died. And Francis weighed in to say, yes, that is correct. Uh, that was, to my mind, a huge and decisive moment in this debate. I don't think you can argue with it. He then goes on to say, well, maybe Kennedy would have changed his mind. Well, first of all, you don't know. Secondly, it's very unlikely because uh, people who spoke to Kennedy, and my father was close to Kennedy, uh, knew that uh, he was pursuing a line of policy that he had held from the beginning, really from the early 1950s. Understand that we should not be fighting a war in Vietnam because we cannot win. Uh, and because the, the continuation of the French uh, colonial experience was not something we should be doing. He was never in favor of that. Uh, so th that was that was clear. Uh, but the other point was the plan meant a phased drawdown of the relatively small force that was there. It was only 17,000 people. Uh, so you bring some of them out and then bring some more of them out. Um, by the time you've done a little bit of that, you don't have very many left. Uh, and so you are not in a position where you can practically reverse the, the decision without uh, you know throwing everything into reverse gear. Uh, so uh, it's not as though uh, I mean, it's not as though it was 17,000 that would be withdrawn on December 30th, 1965. By, by that point, or by the election in 64, there wouldn't have been that many left. Uh, and the point of drawing it out was 
first of all, so to diffuse it as a political issue and so that Kennedy would not be accused of um, abandoning, losing Vietnam before the 64 election. Well, and that's not greatly to Kennedy's credit. It meant that more people would be killed and there would be more conflict that, you know, that we would not have, uh, you know, you know, in, in order to preserve his, his 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 presidency, but on the other hand, he had reasons for that, uh, and, and uh, so I'm not going to you know say that uh, I would have done any different. A, a person who operates in the political world has political uh, considerations that they have to take into account. Uh, right. So, but in any event, uh, the underlying point was uh, if something Peter uh, Scott started in 1972. I really think Francis Bator put the, 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 the final serious punctuation mark on it. Uh, I can re- uh, bring out that letter. Uh, and Francis, as I say, was the loyalist to Lyndon Johnson. He is uh, just really incontrovertible on the point. Right. I agree. Now you had a, uh... You got to know Peter. Um, I don't know when you first uh, had contact with him, but I saw around the time that I started reading his work, which was after the Obama uh, election, and I worked for Obama, and then he, it, it didn't really change anything, and it made me look deeper into U.S. the the, the U.S. foreign policy and the U.S. Em- empire. And I, I became familiar with Peter's work, and I saw that he had around that time had had a been at a symposium uh, that you held for him at university of Texas. Uh, what was that? Do you have any, re- any recollections about that or what was it like uh, seeing Peter in that setting? I, I, my impression is that was the first time I actually met him face to face. And uh, the, uh, uh, it, it was a, you know, an event of, uh, a, a real a privilege and honor for me uh, that he would come um, and uh, you know sh- share his views, uh, share his experience here. Uh, they uh, so that's really all I can all I can really say about it. Is I don't know what what this I, I couldn't tell you right now what specifically that symposium contributed to the to the uh, uh, to the range of knowledge on this question, which by two thousand ten was. About seven years after after the uh, Boston Review piece and the Salon piece, which came out shortly after that, uh, so um, really, I think its its value was for those people who 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 had not really paid close attention uh, to the um, uh, to these questions and who for whom they were you know, they were news. Uh, but as I say, for for me, the the value was you know the, that Peter was willing to come. Uh, and and uh, uh, and join me in Austin uh, and talk about it here on on Lyndon Johnson's home turf. Uh, and again, uh, my own view on these matters is not at all hostile to Johnson's uh, the predicament that Johnson was in, but that because that's because you begin to have an understanding of what Johnson was navigating, which was far more complex than what Kennedy was navigating from his point of view, and it was made more complex by the fact that Kennedy had been killed. Uh, so Johnson was operating in a much more openly, clearly treacherous, difficult environment. Uh, you know, Ken- Kennedy's was plenty along that way. There was no doubt about that. My father was uh, Kennedy's ambassador to India, and there's you know clear clear knowledge that the cross currents in this policy are very very strong. But uh, obviously, the assassination adds a whole massively uh, critical dimension to it. Johnson also later voiced suspicions about the CIA and those elements being behind the Kennedy assassination. And we'll never know ex- precisely, but that must have had some impact on the way, on, on some of his decisions. Do you, do you think that's the case? I'm quite confident it's the case, of course. Uh, Johnson is working in an environment where he, uh, Johnson was no. Uh, no spring chicken. He <laughs> wasn't born yesterday. You could use your metaphor. Lyndon Johnson knew the knew the school. Uh, yes. and so he was he was working. And Johnson, you know, the, I, I I'm quite con- persuaded on Vietnam that Johnson didn't want to go there, didn't want to get in. Uh, that uh, I, to if you could draw a little difference between the early interpretations of Insom two seventy three uh, and uh, and what I think now. 
uh, uh, Johnson was uh, uh, the, the, the main effect of that uh, statement or that order that was signed a few days after Kennedy was killed uh, was to launch the um, O Plan uh, 60, uh, 63. 30, 34A, I think. 34A, that's right, 34A, uh, which was the speedboat raids uh, to on on on, on targets in offshore North Vietnam, uh, which led to the to the Tonkin Gulf incident. Uh, it, exactly how much Johnson would have known about the what he was signing off on at that instant, I think it's a little still a little unclear. One of the things I noted uh, in uh, the uh, it's in the Boston Review piece, is that the authorization to the to Saigon to, to go ahead with this came a day before Johnson signed the, the order. So that it was the, the, the process of, of pushing this in happened very, very quickly after Kennedy was killed. Um, and it led, of course, in 64 to uh, to the to the first Duncan Gulf incident, at which point we know uh, from the records of the you know, from the report of the witnesses that were per- present at that first National Security Council meeting, Johnson was extremely skeptical, and uh, that uh, he was maneuvered in or trapped into the resolution. Uh, but this was the idea that many of us had that this was sort of Johnson's moving us toward the war. Uh, it was not correct. Uh, he was doing everything he could to to, to continue to maneuver. Uh, to put the whole thing off, and it really wasn't until early '65 that the trap closed on him, and at that point, uh, the, the war takes off uh, with Pleiku. So those are these are uh, you know my my I have a really um, much more nuanced uh, and sympathetic view, uh, really an admiring view in some ways of of how Johnson attempted to to uh, to deal with the forces that were all around him. So are you saying that the uh, CIA, the, the, the military, the Pentagon or the CIA um, officers in Saigon approve, were, were giving the go ahead to launch those O-Plan 34A operations before the NSAM was actually signed? Because that would mean they I think that's a like almost on my the Boston day. Review. Yeah. Okay. I think that's I, I, that detail. Definitely. Yeah, I, I forgot that detail then because... Um, that's, that would have been on like November 23rd or something like that, or 24th. I mean, it was like almost 24th, I think, uh, I think the 23rd, 23rd or 24th, 24th. And the NSIM was signed on the 25th is my recollection. I'd have to go back and look, but that's, that's what my memory tells me now. Yeah. Right after the assassination. Well, that's amazing. James Galbraith, thank you very much for speaking with us today. It's always a pleasure, Aaron. And uh, uh, it's it, let me just say once again, and I, I imagine Peter will will, will see this. That it's just uh, to me a terrific honor to be associated in any way with Peter Dale Scott. He's one of the one of the great monuments of our time, in my view, one of the really great uh, human beings that I've had a privilege to know. I agree completely. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that it is very cool that we got to hear from Professor James Galbraith. I would have loved to have been able to attend that symposium for Peter at the University of Texas in Austin all those years ago. Uh, Too bad they didn't record it, but that's the way it goes sometimes. We are going to play some segments featuring three noteworthy admirers of Peter's work. The first is Joshua Oppenheimer, celebrated director of two phenomenal Indonesia documentaries, The Act of Killing, and The Look of Silence. The second is Daniel Ellsberg, the Pentagon Papers whistleblower and peace activist. Uh, He also happens to be Peter's best friend. The third is John Kiriakou, the former CIA officer who went to jail for blowing the whistle on the CIA's illegal torture program. Uh, He has some interesting insights into what the agency thought of Peter's work back in the day. I'm, I'm so happy to meet you, uh, Peter, as, as I've told you, and I'll tell the class briefly, I'm in the middle of, I'm unfortunately in the middle of a meeting with a composer about a musical film that we're working on, but I left so that I could, for a few minutes, so that I could just say hello. And I just, I'm just so happy to meet you. And no, to tell the class cry. that I made two films about 
the events that so haunted and inspired, if that's the right word, the poem coming to Jakarta. And my films were very much inspired by that poem. The first film, The Act of Killing, uh, I came out in 2013 and the second one in 2015, The Look of Silence. But I've been, I'm a, the deepest sort of fan and honored to be in your company and, and to meet you in person. Well, this is an honor likewise for me. You know, in my poem, I say, I'm writing something, I say, even though this is not going to make any difference, I'm going to write it anyway. And then you said your films were inspired by my poem, and your films certainly made a huge difference in Indonesia. They broke the code of silence about the massacre in Indonesia. The first one was banned in Indonesia, but of course people have internet, so they were able to see it anyway. And the second one provoked official discussions, the first ever, about what had happened in this country back in 1965. So it's hard to, I can't think of another film that has had as much influence on a country's destiny as yours. And if my poem helped you in your process of making the films, that makes me reconsider my whole sense of whether or not it's worth writing poetry. And I, and uh, well, I, in Poetry and Terror, I talk about this paradox that the powerless became powerful. And film, if I was young, I'd start all over again in film, I think. Well, it, it, it definitely, I remember actually I was considering a few different projects and the earliest material from uh, the, the, what became actually, what actually came, ended up in the, look, in the look of silence, but the process that grew into shooting the act of killing, I'd filmed, but it was so singular and the, and the kind of overarching, net, it was so specific to, to, the banks of this one river in North Sumatra, for all I understood initially, where 10,500 people were killed. It was so specific to that, that I had trouble understanding how I would then dedicate the next years of my life. It became uh, the next 11 years of my life working on those two films. But then I, first I read your essay, your kind of analysis of what happened in, in Indonesia. And then I, and that, that, then I thought, how would I render that artistically? Or how would I make a statement that embodies my feelings about this? And then I came upon your poem, and I was considering another project actually in the United States, also a, what could have been very worthwhile. But your poem just captured my heart in a way that forced me to listen to the voices in my head the voices of my friends in North Sumatra who were saying, please don't give this up, please pursue it. And your poem kind of provided me its lyricism, its fervor, its moral clarity and its beauty and terror forced me to sort of, not, not forced me, it, it showed me how a work in another medium could, could successfully sort of immersively force one to look at really the, the, the sort of dark underbelly of what we are and the system that sustains us. And I thought that's what I must do in a film and I must listen to those friends from these villages in the plantation belt of North Sumatra where I started these two films yeah. and return and focus on that. So it, it is no exaggeration to say your poem is what gave me the aesthetic clarity as a filmmaker to, to, to make those two films. And I, I don't know that I would have without them, which is why I always jump at the opportunity to engage with you. And this one was no different. I was hoping Dan could comment on coming to Jakarta and the significance of Peter dedicating the companion piece to him and how he feels he and Peter have influenced each other in their trajectories. Well, of course, it's a very great honor uh, to have that dedicated to me. And I think it's a timeless work. And um, I love that. Uh, Peter, you know, worked on briefs or analyses of the papers for my trial uh, before I'd ever met him. 
And uh, so I, I owe him that from the beginning. And he's been on that from the beginning. But he's become my closest friend here. We've had many hours and I've, as I've learned and uh, no, I'm, <laughs> there's no one I've learned more from. I, uh, likewise, Dan, likewise. <laughs> <laughs> John Kiriakou, the CIA went to the trouble of intercepting Peter's 1971 Ramparts article on CIA Air America heroin trafficking. So from your time at the CIA, can you tell us what the agency thought about the work of Peter Dale Scott? You know, when I was at the CIA, people talked about Peter, as you might imagine. They talked about Peter. Uh, they talked about people like uh, Philip Agee uh, is another example. And they said markedly different things about the two of them. Uh, Philip Agee, every senior CIA officer I knew or old timer that I knew wanted to kill Philip Agee, right? They wanted to hunt him down, whether he was in Cuba or in Spain or wherever he happened to be, and kill him. That was not what they said about, about Peter. Peter was taken seriously. Peter was was seen as the more dangerous of the two because he could back up what he was saying. He wasn't just naming names and, you know, writing a book. He was saying things that he could attribute to academic sources to back up his position. And it was more difficult for the CIA to counter that. With AG, all they had to do is say, AG's a traitor, right? AG killed Dick uh, Welch, which he didn't. And people would say, oh, A.G., he was crazy. He went to the other side. He went with the communists. They couldn't say anything like that about Peter. And that's what made Peter so dangerous. And that's what makes Peter so valuable to historians and to people who take these issues as seriously as you and I do. So, Ben, we also have to point out that Peter was one of the first people to write about sexual blackmail as an institution within our system of governance. This is pretty serious. Yeah. Yeah. And he wrote about that in his, in his book, Deep Politics and the Death of JFK, uh, in a section titled Sex, the Mob and Intelligence in Washington. He writes, one of the most underreported political topics is the extent to which prostitution in Washington has been the key to ongoing corruption and scandal in that city. Like other researchers, I have listened to a retired Washington detective, one who played a small but important role in Watergate. He is convinced that the systematic sexual seduction of Congress and the administration is an ongoing, highly organized, and protected operation. This claim has long formed part of the anti-establishment rhetoric of puritanical right-wing extremists, but there is also empirical evidence to support it. Subsequent revelations about Watergate in 1972 and the so-called Koreagate scandal of 1978 corroborates his hypothesis that mob-supplied call girls, with their phones bugged by intelligence agents, have driven the major scandals of Washington since at least the beginning of the Cold War. Scholarly memories, possibly because of den denial, tend to be short when it comes to sexual politics. Few now remember, for example, that the first congressional investigation of military lobbying by Howard Hughes in 1947 drew attention to the women that Hughes's press agent, John Meyer, had procured for military men, including President Roosevelt's son, Elliot. Oh, what the... Wait, I know that song. Oh shit, it's true or not. Liz Franchek, Embrace Belden. As you guys started to cover the Epstein saga, uh -huh. were you already aware of this material? <laughs> or did the Epstein case radicalize you? I mean, was it Peter's work or the Epstein case or something else? What is it that knocked you out of your, your middle-class complacency or, or, or whatever it was? Uh, or were you guys just like based uh, at birth? Well, what an interesting question. Yeah. Um, I, you want me, I can start first? Yeah, go ahead, Brace. Just uh, take it away. All right. So I think, well, I mean, anybody who knows even a marginal amount about how uh, intelligence agencies or even mafias or any kind of criminal enterprise operates, uh, if you're going to do blackmail, Sexual blackmail, that's the way to go. Yeah. Right? That's how you always get them. And so I think I was actually first introduced to the concept of it from reading John Le, Le Carre books when oh, I was sure. like a teenager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then as I started uh, you know, growing up and learning more and more about uh, you know, 
real world stuff that had happened, uh, I realized it was an actual um, pretty uh, pretty common thing used uh, for a pretty long time. Um, I mean, famously, you know, you have Mata Hari during World War One, but uh, especially as like photography. And things like that became more advanced and cameras got smaller and uh, spy agencies became more sophisticated. Uh, of course, the amount of ways that you could sexually blackmail people uh, increased as well. And so I think the Epstein thing was just like, I don't know if it was like, I, I think it was just something that was crazy that was happening. Uh, like, I don't, I don't know if you remember at that time, but I mean, it was fucking, I mean, it, was, it was kind of pandemonium in the press and among the public. Uh, and it seemed to be a real life case of that happening sort of as it was as we were speaking yeah it's funny i mean i i'm trying to think back on when that concept first entered my brain i honestly have no idea and i want to say that it was sort of like in detective stories like yeah. it kind of in a fictionalized form you know and it wasn't until later that you know as you're kind of growing up and you start learning about the kind of horrors of U.S. Empire, and then you kind of like start digging into that a little bit more, and you're like, hey, wait, maybe there's something about this underlying system of extraction and and exploitation that kind of feeds this whole beast, and then you start putting more and more stuff together, and then kind of the stuff that you have been reading about that was fiction starts to kind of fit in like a puzzle piece to kind yeah. of fill in that larger picture about how these kind of systems of exploitation and extraction and um, oppression like continue to perpetuate themselves and grow stronger right and what kind of what tools and technologies they use and and so I yeah I guess I'm when the Epstein thing hit it wasn't so much like um, like kind of like exploding our brains or my brain into like oh wow I didn't know this existed so much as it's like holy shit, this is like such a perfect example of this yeah. nexus of all of these different touchstones, yeah. right? Like that exploring it gives us such a window into how all of these um, kind of tools and um, really tool sets of the, you know, I don't know, people in charge and their henchmen and everything else kind of like operate. Yeah, yeah, and I think the Epstein case also just like touches on so many different facets, just even beyond sexual blackmail um, of 20th century and uh, 21st century, like crime uh, and, you know, political uh, malfeasance, I guess you mm. could say. I mean, Epstein and Ghislaine, especially, and especially through Ghislaine's family, I mean, touches on everything from like high technology to, uh, you know, to Israel, to arms dealing, to Khashoggi. I love just saying Israel <laughs> as just like, it's just, well, that kinda, it mean, just encompasses a lot, a lot of things. things. There's a lot going on there. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just, and, you know, to the Cold War, it's just like, um, you know, it's, it's one of those, uh, maps that really like lies pretty neatly over the latter half of the 20th mm. century and early part of the 21st. Yeah. And it goes, I mean, you, you go back to Matahari, but it goes back way further than that in some ways. Yeah. The, Peter traces you, it back. If you go back to, um, it, chi ancient China, there's four classical beauties of the sort of dynastic period of Chinese history, which is many thousands of years. Right. And two of the four, classic beauties of Chinese antiquity were uh, honey traps in some way, like people yeah. like sexual actors in a, in political intrigue. So this is like, this I think rises in tandem with if, if farming is the oldest profession, prostitution might be the second oldest profession, but sexual blackmail emerges, you know, probably pretty early on in the, in our, in our, uh, in our whole history of the like um, <clears throat> division of labor and all this. I mean, it's pretty yeah. crazy. Because people are horny throughout history. That's so true. Yeah, that's the that's a that's the pull quote. Right yeah, there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I gotta be honest though, <laughs> if you were trying to trick somebody uh, at any period, I'm gonna say like prior to like 400 years ago, you could basically just tell someone like, "Hey, there's a spring that gives you eternal life down there." Like, it's just really far away. And you could probably get anyone to leave any country that they're in by just tricking them into thinking that they could live forever by drinking some some kind of water. Mm. It's the human condition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> People are so thirsty. <laughs> People are so thirsty and so horny throughout history. <laughs> yeah. 
that this is true. And this is the sort of micro human condition that gets that, that people can play on to, you know, hatch their schemes and, uh, for the powerful and so on. And as we get, get this into the modern era, it, it's quite grim and industrial in its scale, not just the sexual yeah. blackmail issues, but the whole project that it's really geared towards. And Peter Dale Scott is someone who has delved into the darkness, uh, even as our main organs of, uh, you know, sense making the institutions of sense making like the, the academy and the media they're trying to tell us how great we are all the time but peter was always there minding the darkness and doing this looking at this has caused him some anguish at certain points uh psychic anguish really he famously mm. dealt with this uh, through poetry at one stage writing coming to jakarta and uh, this allows it, a, a person to use language to grapple with subtext and subconscious or suppressed feelings and, and subjects that you can't really talk about openly or, or straightforwardly. Now, you guys have you did put Peter's poetry in one of your episodes, which I thought was really cool. And, and Noam Chomsky had a, a cool production added to that. I really appreciated that. You guys haven't done a full on poetry slam. But do you think that in your own way, the, the comedy and the, the irony uh, are, are are ways that you can help yourselves and the audience be able to mind the darkness, so to speak, without just uh, surrendering to it or, or giving into despair? How does this function? I mean, I think absolutely, right? I think, like, it's tough. Like, I, I think one of the criticisms we get of our podcast, well, we get a lot of criticisms, but one of the one that I'm thinking of that's not, you know, that doesn't have to do with us just constantly going on different tangents yeah, all over yeah, the place. Yeah. People, people, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, uh, is, you know, that sometimes like it's too dark. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's too heavy. And I think that it's tough because you kind of want, at least when we're um, like looking for episode topics, it's sort of like, I think we we get a little it's like a little nerve wracking because you're sort of like oh no is this going to be too much like over and over yeah, and over yeah. again and I think one way like you're saying to temper that a little bit is with you know our classico rapport and you know being able to find some some lightness in it in order but also to like kind of effectively communicate how dark it is I mean I think those are sort of like you know two sides of the same coin sometimes. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I, I agree with all of that. I think that like, there's a couple of things. One is that like, yeah, I mean, for us, I think we'd just go insane if we like presented this like dour retelling of events every every week or twice yeah. a week. Um, second, that's also like, you know, we're not professional radio. I guess we technically are now, but like, we didn't like come into this as professional radio people. It's like this is just how a lot of people just talk in conversation mm. too. Uh, where it's not super serious and like, you know, you're going to kind of go kind of go back and forth. But like, uh, I think at another level too, like, I actually think it makes like for like you want to hit a balance or we, we try to hit a balance where it's like, uh, you know, we cover some pretty dark topics. We also cover some dark topics, but that are kind of funny mm. ones as well. I'm thinking like Shrimp Boy and stuff like that. Sure. Um, but, uh, you know, you're also making radio that people want to hear. And so it's like, you know. I think that there's like a that that's like a way for our audience to also kind of like cope with it and listen to some stuff is it's presented in a way that's not like super like a lecture or something like that. You know what I mean? Uh, and that that makes them just like really depressed. Although I think some of our episodes actually really do that. But mm -hmm. uh, and also I just like I can't talk normal either. So like I can't really just like uh, speak really seriously all the time because I'm a happy-go-lucky Mr. Sunshine guy. Um, but yeah, I think that like, I think it helps. I also think it helps communicate ideas that are sometimes pretty heavy to an audience that isn't necessarily looking for super heavy stuff, but is receptive to that information when it's presented to them, right? So like if we do a sort of like really serious topics with like maybe some serious academics or like serious, you know, like, you know, the 9-11 stuff that we did, you know, including with you, uh, you know, or or some of these like more like uh, heady history heavy stuff. Mm. Uh, if it's presented in this sort of um, popular way, 
I think people uh, who might not otherwise even come across this stuff or feel inclined to listen to anything about this stuff would actually be more inclined to 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 imbibe that stuff. That's something that we found. So it's 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 worked to our advantage like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually find. I would guess that that you feel the same way. I find watching Fox or MSNBC or reading uh, like Time Magazine, I find that more depressing than oh, yeah. some of the grimmest things dealing with with uh, you know the different aspects of imperialism and so on. Because it's just the amount of bullshit that's out there that, that yeah, is hard for to. Sure. Yeah. That, that once you understand it, that actually becomes grimmer. And I don't really have the. I don't think I can really go. I, I would guess you are probably at the same point. You you can't really go back to thinking that everything is fine, and accepting the dominant uh, framework of our yeah. society. It's it is depressing, and you may in and dead serious. You may need to write poetry to deal with it. You may need to tell some jokes, do a number of bits to to deal with it yourself, and to make it presentable. You may need to, uh, you know, have like different out, unconventional outlets like adult baby play and things like that Classic, some people yeah. are into i'm not that's not my thing but i don't judge people yeah. <laughs> uh whatever it takes really because it's like we, you've got to have a way of dealing with it yeah yeah that, yeah you ha- it's there psychologically you can't deal with it politically yeah so how can we deal with I it i think we could deal with the adult baby problem politically that problem but i mean that, <laughs> I'm just, that I, I know i'm just joking as a way right. to deal with the psychic injury of living in this society no, yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. the adult baby route for sure i just always keep rocking that's my number one thing yeah and me i'm a rolling she's rolling i'm rocking that's it i i yeah i mean no totally i think it's really important also just in general for people to have like uh, creative outlets to express themselves with even if they're not totally enmeshed in in really sordid stuff just because I think just the way society is structured, you go and say no matter what, even if you aren't li- reading the news at all, mm. uh, unless you have some sort of way to to express I mean, your spirit. Yeah, this is this is true. We got to find a way. You got to find ways to deal with this and circumstances are going to change and uh, then it will be very fascinating. Um, well, I really want to thank you guys both for stopping by today and for Always talking with us. Yeah, of course. And uh, we, I, I look forward to hearing uh, whatever you guys are up to next because it's always entertaining. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Well, props to True and On for joining this campaign. Amazing how they have that automated entrance music thing going on. You at home couldn't see the pyrotechnics and fog machine action, so you're just going to have to trust me. It's pretty fantastic. I feel I should pause here to remind everyone that the purpose of this whole episode is to promote the GoFundMe campaign for Peter Dell Scott's medical and publishing expenses. Please find the link in the show notes or the QR code if you are watching the video version and are able to contribute. Our next speaker is Noah Colwin, another anti-imperialist podcaster. Noah used to write for Lice Magazine. What? Sorry. And with apologies to the humble louse, Noah Colwyn wrote for Vice Magazine before becoming the co-host of the epic podcasting series known as Blowback. So you used to write for more mainstream publications, uh, but you have either become more radical or perhaps you were just hiding it before like a, like a good infiltrator. Uh, specifically in Blowback Season 2, you start to get more into Peter's wheelhouse, which is uh, the overworld and the over- and the underworld and this mafia Wall Street Washington symbiosis uh, that we really saw in Cuba and, you know, in other places where U.S. imperialism has, has found uh, a home. Uh, how did you come to draw from material like the scholarship of Peter Dale Scott? Uh, because... In your analysis, you guys go way beyond generic liberal or even uh, standard Marxist takes on all this material. So, how did this all how did this all happen? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, deep politics and the death of JFK was instrumental in shaping my perception of that really critical moment in Cold War history, and the language that Peter Dale Scott came up with in using the term deep politics was for me immensely clarifying in a in that it explained how you connect the sort of overworld 
general history of the Cold War, much of which is, you know, correct and valuable and true on its own, with the series of, uh, you know, sort of below the surface political explosions that help explain some of these, you know, both crazy public phenomena, but also the larger machinations of power. And when you look at something like the Cuban Revolution, and you look at how it's connected to American politics in the 1960s, uh, it's through work like that of Peter Dale Scott's that you're able to actually start to fill in some of the question, fill in some of the, uh, n- you know, negative space uh, left by the mainstream narrative. Yeah, I agree. And this is something that Peter talks about in deep politics. He actually writes about, so he says, he talks about the need for enmindment. And that's actually the name of his new book. And this is so he's talking about something connected to mindfulness, but he wasn't really doing it in the Sam Harris sort of phony, uh, you know, corporate way. He, he was referring more to the, the the ways that we can express that we try to struggle with expressing and understanding truths that are not readily accessed through or, or assessed through um, the normal you know media, academia, and so on. And uh, this 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 way of trying to grapple with this material while still grounding it in evidence, you know, and, and em- empirical data, theoretical arguments. This was like. Something he's t- he took on almost on his own. I mean, other people were writing in this vein, but not not really. Uh, and now I feel like we're all we've kind of inherited this world, and it's like he was he's been proven more or less correct. I mean, do you do you feel like his work has aged that way as well? Or yeah, I think that I think that I think that Peter Dale Scott's work has aged in this really kind of uh, magnificent uh, way, in part because very few people, very few scholars get to produce a body of research that can become something on which other people can build. And you can, you know, examine new theses, you can find uh, and test old theses against new evidence, you can find all sorts of um, new angles of insight, simply by picking up, I think, you know, one or all of his books. And that to me is a, you know, it's, it's a rare treat to be able to have somebody whose scholarship and who's, you know, uh, wide range and who, whose recognition that this stuff was worth synthesizing into, um, if not like, you know, an isolated discipline, but at least a distinct form of analysis, uh, it's made it possible for other people to, you know, pick up where he's left off. Right. And in the generic sense, I mean, when we talk about gangsters in the underworld, h- how different is the logic of organized crime uh, compared to that of uh, Standard Oil when it comes down to it? Well, you know, I think that um, I, I, I often myself personally think back to Thurston Veblen and his observations uh, about the ways in which uh, elite capitalist culture in America reproduces itself and what are the mores and ideals that it holds uh, tight and clear. So it's, you know, and, and I think that if you look at somebody like Veblen and you end up seeing, oh, wow, a lot of the values and ideals um, in search of, you know, securing pecuniary advantage in, you know, general American society, like, you know, that's the stuff in Goodfellas, you know, to be crude about it, to be vulgar. But I think to be a little bit less vulgar, what you find are often that people who do organized crime end up in government or connected to people in government because part of what makes effective organized crime is having, you know, knowing who you got to pay off, knowing who you, who, who you got to juice. And often these people are used and instrumentalized in such a way so as to more effectively advance the interests of people who are in power. And the conflict of interests in transparency about those facts has made it very difficult for a so-called free society to, I think, have, you know, develop any kind of coherent theses about, you know, what a thing like organized crime is, if we're just not willing to look at what it is that abets it. Um, You know, even if we don't live in the days of Joe Mafioso or something, quite clearly, we live in some kind of screwed up world in which people can, you know, collectively, uh, corporations are allowed to, I think, organize in cartel-like fashion and determine the outcomes of, uh, terms of determine the you know outcomes of humanity for better for worse <laughs> usually for worse yeah in terms of the government i mean they end up 
the same government that the mobsters have to pay off or the, the, the big business bribes them also. I mean, it, it's really, it's quite a system that we've, we've put together here. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Peter has also done, I think, uh, amazing work, like really peerless work on the China lobby, sometimes called the Far Eastern lobby because it sort of expands into, you know, South Korea and Hong Kong and Taiwan and stuff after World War II. Um, but their connections to U.S. foreign policy, this comes up specifically in Blowback Season 3. How do you think his deep politics approach has added to your understanding of the Korean War? Well, part of it is because if you start from the premise that the Korean War didn't actually just happen because the North ran southward and that there was instead a sequence of events that led up to that event, uh, Peter Dale Scott's work is indispensable in reaching a fairly firm conclusion about what that sequence of events looked like. His work in establishing the role of the China lobby in guiding American foreign policy decision-making right up until the moment that the 38th parallel was so desacralized by the North Koreans, uh, it's, 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 it is, it establishes business and commercial ties uh, converging with diplomatic interests and intrigue and his reevaluation of the record there has been you know uh championed by no less than bruce cummings who cites it in his book the korean war but i i really do think that if you want to try and say well if the mainstream narrative or the conventional narrative about something is wrong and you've got to instead then generate a new idea um you've got to instead generate a new understanding of well what did happen then I don't think that you can answer the question of, well, how did the Korean War begin without looking at Peter Dale Scott's work on the China lobby and what the interests in the Kuomintang were on trying to begin a campaign toward, yes, overturning the communists in North Korea, but also ultimately unseating communist China. Right. I mean, they were uh, at the... They, he also makes the argument that it was partially to take the heat off of Taiwan, right? I mean, is, am I mis misremembering Absolutely. that? Absolutely. That His argument this war was that basically, you... the he, he, that basically the Chinese were gonna the China the the his argument is that the the, the communist uh, Chinese government was ready to move on Taiwan to reunify China. Uh, you know what was effectively the last bastion of of colonial control, and instead we got a war in Korea. And there wasn't really the capacity for the Chinese government, which was not, you know, which which had not entered the war in the uh, sense of, you know, like th there weren't Chinese troops yet uh, engaged on the ground in combat, um, although there were volunteers. What Peter Del Scott observed, and it's a very important argument, was that by actively lobbying for and getting a war in Korea in the summer of 1950, Taiwan and the Kuomintang and Chiang Kai-shek would be saved from an invasion by Red China that same year. Right. And the other the other main structural factor, which you guys don't uh, go into, but I think this is something Peter would, uh, Peter and I have spoken about, and, and we may go more into d depth on this at some point, is that in 1950, you have NSC 68, which is basically calling for a huge rearmament of the, of the U.S., and the, if you break down the arguments, it's less about an act, the fear of a Soviet invasion. It's more about the fear of European neutrality and countries trading with communist countries that would break down the U.S. plans. And so the iron, the, this ramped up Cold War and massive military spending was their way of like solidifying this and protecting their vision of a U.S. empire. And Korea ends up coming along at the exact perfect time to essentially allow for the adoption of this. So there's there are many reasons to suspect that that the motives, all the motives of the most powerful actors in the Korean War are, are have not were not fully uh, and candidly admitted at the time. I mean, it's really a, it's a if you try to understand why such a huge senseless slaughter over territory that's not ex extremely important in and of its own or, or by itself then you see these other issues and, and they still are, they're so relevant to today. So I think it's like, it's, it's very important to go back and look at that. It shouldn't be the forgotten Absolutely. war if we want to understand all this. Imperialism isn't just a story about vibes. It's a story of economic and political relationships. 
And, you know, Lenin argued that imperialism was market expansion by another name. And in the case of the Cold War, part of what Peter Dale Scott has shown is that imperialism indeed did survive the age of its supposed death. And he gives us the tools and ability to see the forms that it takes today. I, I think that's a good way to sum it up. And uh, I really appreciate you for taking the time to talk to us. So thank you very much, Noah Cohen. My pleasure. We have split this into two parts due to length, and that is about it for part one. Please do use the length or the QR code to donate what you can for Peter. We tried to make this more of a tribute with a collection of guests and segments that would be interesting on their own rather than something that would play like a PBS fun drive. Uh, maybe I'm not great at this fundraising business because I haven't been plugging it incessantly. I don't want to do that, so we're saving this mostly for right now. Please do donate if you can. I would like to thank our two American Exception producers, Dana Chavaria and Seamus McGinnis, and I would like to thank Mock Orange for providing the music. I want to express my deep gratitude for all of the American Exception subscribers on Patreon. Because of your support, I was able to spend a lot of time putting this thing together to help my friend, mentor, and co-author, Peter Dale Scott. If you're not a subscriber, please consider joining us at patreon.com slash American Exception. And finally, again, please do support this GoFundMe campaign for Peter Dale Scott through the link or the QR code. Peter Descott deserves our support for a life spent minding the light. 